Hey guys, I am out at the Maasai and uh, the community is Oromit. I brought our volunteers here uh, so they could be greeted by the tribe and they've met a lot of the tribe anyway with the amount of warriors who work at Sher Tanzania but just to get the cultural understanding that's why we've brought them along. So they've gone off for a walk in the bush and as you know I can't walk very far so I thought I'd sit it out and uh, chill out with some of the Morans but I've excused myself and perched my camera on top of my walking stick so I hope it doesn't fall off because I felt like making a video and I felt like making this video for a little while and I haven't gotten around to doing it so I thought why not now while I've got some time to kill my Kimasai is not the best so communication is not great here Swahili not so bad Masai terrible <laughs> so it's its own language I I want to talk about the Archon and the Demiurge. Many people ask about it and I don't want to talk about the uh, theological discussion. I don't want to talk about the, uh, the written ideas of other people. I just want to talk about the concept where it's born from and, and the philosophy behind it and what it's all about exactly. And in recent years I know it's been made famous by David Icke because he starts uh, speaking about Archon, this demigod that created our reality and uses it as like an energy extraction matrix is how he described it. But the term Archon comes from the Nag Hammadi and the Nag Hammadi is a part of the collection of ancient Chris Christian texts which uh, are also known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in there there is a story of creation whereby the creator of this reality, the Archon, is a demiurge, it's a lesser god. And what happened was the Sophia, the Divine Feminine, decided to birth a child without involving a male, and in doing so created the Archon. And the Archon had problems and was amnesic and didn't realize that they were not the original god. So they thought they were the original god. And they said it's a very powerful creative force, but not the original source of creation. So the Archon created this reality and forgot that it was not the original god. But what it also says is that the Archon took its mother, the Sophia, and trapped it in matter to use that energy. So it says the fragmentation of that energy is us, we are the Sophia trapped in matter. Now, a lot of people say that it's blasphemous to entertain the idea that uh, the creator of this world is not the original God, but I would like to point out that the Bible wholeheartedly stands against that opinion in a big, big way, and Jesus as well. So it's open for discussion and should be discussed because it's important and it helps to start understanding our reality, which is sometimes tricky to understand. So there is, of course, similar roots in what's been said there with uh, Luciferianism, whereas Luciferians believed that Adam and Eve were trapped in matter and the serpent that came was actually an angel from the original source of creation and tried to liberate them and they show this they say you know that god told them if you eat of that fruit of, uh, if you eat of the fruit of the tree then you're going to die but they didn't die but what if they didn't literally die what if they died in a in a in an energetic way and by that I mean if you look around and you see the the animals of this world like your dog at home they seem because they don't have the carnal mind they just seem so much more vibrant and full of energy and the same with my son at the moment he hasn't yet developed his uh, intellect and his his ego and thus he's very vibrant and full of love and energy at the moment so Maybe it's a different type of death that we suffer. Now, I've spoke about this before, and of course the story of Adam and Eve is an allegory. And for me, that's not open for discussion. Snakes don't talk. There's no scientific evidence that humanity stemmed from two persons somewhere located in the world. But what there is plenty of evidence for is the fact that when you split an electron from an atom, or you take Eve from Adam, the rib, uh, to create Eve, then you start the multiplication of all life. 
and it's an allegory for the splitting of the atom. It's very clear, and uh, you see it, especially if you read the other uh, Adam and Eve texts, which I've covered in brief when I spoke about uh, the lines in Christianity, the texts that are left out of the Bible. You, you really see the allegory behind it all and why it's there, because it's important, because that is the origin of life. The origin of life is not a man and woman, because the origin of man and woman is the splitting of an atom. So the origin of life is way before them, and that's what the splitting of Adam, Adam and Eve is, Adam and Eve is, or atom and electron. So for me, it's not literal, but the serpent is the introduction of choice. And I've said this before, that when you have the introduction of choice, you can choose to do good, or you can choose to do bad. You can do go one way or the other. And that's ultimately what the serpent is. And every day, the serpent always tries to tempt you all the time. But what, how does that reflect upon the story of our creation? Well, when I look out in nature, I really struggle with the idea that there is a loving, controlling force behind it all. So I always came to the conclusion there were natural forces that were put in place, laws, to allow for this expression of life to be what it is. And as you begin to understand the polarity of things and, and this temptation of humans to feel that one side is going to win and that creates this anxiety in us that evil might beat good and good might beat evil and dark might win over light and light might win over dark. It's nonsense because they're opposites so one can't exist without the other. But the anxiety we feel that one might win over the other is part of the human illusion and part of the game we play but a necessary one. You know, that, that this is the expression of this reality. This is how it works. So then you take a look at uh, how the world around us works. Now, in the natural world, and I see young newborn animals getting torn apart here, or I see baby antelopes caught by a baboon and eaten piece by piece with their fingers without killing them from the back up, from the anus up. It's just brutal, harsh, disgusting, violent, and, and horrible. And yes, we might, if we had no knowledge of good and evil, we might accept that it's normal, but I'm happy I have a knowledge of good and evil, so I'm not a monkey in the woods who's tearing an animal apart and not comprehending the suffering and pain that I'm doing to it, which is what happens with a baboon. They don't have the empathy for the pain that something else is going through, we do. Now, some animals do find empathy. We see this hunters, sometimes leopards will adopt baby animals from the ones they kill and so on, Lep tiger, uh, lions too here. So there is compassion in other beings, but humans have a better ability to express that. But when you look at that, you have to say that either God set about natural laws, and some of these laws are pretty messed up, and that's why such suffering exists, or he's just far too passive with regards to free will, because it's a necessity, otherwise what's the point, and we'd just be robots, and thus allows for that darkness to come through. Or, you can look at what Jesus said, and Jesus said that the God of this world, that his, Jesus said his Father, his father's kingdom is not of this world, so God's kingdom is not of this world. So it also says that Satan is the prince of this world. So if Satan's the prince of this world and God is not the God of this world, then what's going on there? And then you can lean towards this Archon concept and the idea would go that the Archon created this reality and because God is passive when it comes to free will and loves all his children indiscriminately and independently and without judgment, then it comes to the point where he has to allow that to happen. You know, God allows us to be monstrosities on this planet. Look at what we're doing to the planet and the suffering we cause and the ignorance we live in. He allows it. Same as he'll allow for something energetically more powerful than us to live in ignorance if it's his child. So this Archon created this reality according to this uh, concept. And God is slowly trying to make it palatable, like reality is a soup and you're throwing in ingredients to make it palatable and those ingredients are messengers such as Jesus and the Buddha and, and all of those persons who have altered human consciousness uh, and planted the concept inside human minds of spiritual pursuit and the pursuit of God over the pursuit of money and war and so on and so forth. Remember, these are concepts. You could easily live in a human society with zero spiritual concept. And I can't imagine a society like that would be very pleasant, but I'm sure they have been around because they are concepts born out of human thinking. And I find when I'm with more indigenous tribes who are focused on survival, then the concept of spirituality hasn't really entered into them fully, like it would do in the West when you're much more comfortable with your high walls, etc., to protect you from the environment around you. So, when you look at all of that together, it does kind of, it can fit 
you know, no one has the answer because what you have to remember at the end of all of this, people will espouse, oh, I know this and this is how it is, this is how it is. And they're just completely unenlightened beings because they're, they're speaking concepts and concept to concepts. And ultimately all we've got, as I've said, is here. That's it. That's all you've got. That's your reality. That's the only reality you're ever going to have. So when people really fight and stand by something and say, this is how it is, I know this is how it is, then they've either had a direct experience out of body or they are just repeating what they've read and it makes sense to them so that they're, they're hanging on and saying it's so. I can't say one way or the other if this was created by an archon or by the original God. I see the beauty in creation here which is the original source's presence in all creative forces around including ourselves and animals and, and the plant life etc. But perhaps even including an archon or a demiurge that created this reality. Who would know? But what it does do, it solves many problems about how this loving God who wants me to end suffering somehow created a reality with immeasurable suffering but then wants other people to end suffering. It doesn't make sense. But then that's where the Archon thing fits because then it does start to make sense. Because the loving God that I know, uh, I, I, I don't see that God as needing all of this bloodlust and this bloodthirstiness. And this is the unusual thing of the Bible, is this Old Testament God who's bloodthirsty and a monster. He's an he's a absolute monstrous, the, the, the God of the Old Testament, and no one can say he's not. Just constantly demanding blood sacrifices and all of this. And you could even say the God of the New Testament is a bit shady because for some reason the only way he could dream up of forgiving humanity for his sins was to torture his own son. It really doesn't make sense, does it? Because there has to be more deeper meaning to it, because otherwise why torture him? Why do that? Why put him through that for the sake of finding uh, the, the, the ability within you to forgive? I can forgive people without needing to torture and hurt people. And that's because it's trying to show an expression of love. You mean so much that I would do this for your love for me and to save you, to protect you. But when you really look deep at it, then there really some problems be do start to arise because it also states in the Bible where God clearly states, it's like there's a change in God. I delight not in blood sacrifices, he says. So who was asking for them? And these are the conflicts we see of this book. But if you just sit back and take the book away, which is the Nagamadi's where the concept comes from, then even just accept it as a, a concept without your ego coming in with a sober mind, without the information you've read coming in and evaluate it from the present moment, from here, which is all you've got, then you can easily sit philosophically on one side or the other. You can. You can say a demigod could have created it without a shadow of a doubt or could not have. But the important thing about all of it is, and very important, is that they are concepts. And if you're going to side with one side of a concept or the other, that's up to you. But they are still concepts and you will never know until you have a direct experience because truth is here, here, here. That's the only truth you've got. And thus, the understanding of here as the present moment uh, can allow you to dip further into your energy and thus pass beyond the concept of uh, physical matter. But if this physical matter is created by a demiurge or an archon, then perhaps there are snares in there to stop you from seeing outside of the veil and God will be well aware of them because as we know from Jesus he came not of this world he came from not of this world and all of the spiritual teachers speak of the same way that this kingdom the the, the more physical aspect of it is not of their of not of their world not of not the, the kingdom of the father or the mother of the mother father creator so it's an unusual concept. It's a very unusual concept. And there's also the idea that within there, the Archon is also starting to enlighten itself and realize the error in its way of creation, etc. So either side of the fence you can go to, really, if you have an open mind and you are sober-minded. Uh, many people will say, oh, this is heretical because you've said this, but those are people who I can't have theological discussions with because they're not emotionally mature enough to have them. And it's not worth engaging in conversations with people like that because they're just going to throw their emotions at you. But you can't say for certain just because you've read a certain book and everyone says that book's the way it is. You can't say it for certain. But if you go and sit in the bush uh, for as long as you can, like I do, then you can start dwelling on these things and say, yeah, that's a viable solution. That's a viable solution. But at the end of the day, uh, I don't have time to keep evaluating viable solutions because I'm too busy expressing the song that God has placed in my heart. And that is 
I'm able to express that because I don't side with the concepts and I'm aware that they are concepts. So did an archon create this reality? Potentially. Um, did an archon not create this reality? Potentially. But you can't explain away a loving God with the things I see in nature. It's not loving, it's not peaceful. So if we're going to say that God's the Prince of Peace, then he either created it with laws that are needed to be abided by to have that expression um, of what we experience as life, the polarity of things, or indeed a lesser God created an imperfect world and, and the Mother Father original source of creation uh, is trying to coerce its child and also this, this soup of reality into something more palatable for those who experience it. So, Demiurge and the Archon. Love you all. Bye.